Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. So many, many months ago, I got six Chilean cabs from my good friends at Creative Palette to review. This will be the first of six reviews about them. I chose to do one wine per review rather than all six at once to stick to my usual format not have an episode that's like an hour long. With that said, this should be the longest of the six since I'm doing a lot of setup in this episode. And of course, this is a free sample provided to me. Neither Creative Palette nor the winery control how I review the wine or what I say. I'll be going in order of price from low to high in this series. I'd hope to do some kind of alternating valleys, but going by price point will mean I have the three Colchagua wines kind of grouped together in the middle. Also, not every wine is available in every state. So it's possible you can't find a specific wine where you live. Two of the wines are not even available here in Texas, so that's kind of cool. For context, let's discuss the two regions in question. And with that, we'll go to Google Earth Pro. So both regions are in Chile, and Cabernet Sauvignon, along with Carmenere, are very popular there. As you can see, Chile is a very long but narrow country. The farther north, the more arid things are, with it becoming a desert at the same time. As you move south, you will have cooler weather. And while there is something to say how far north or south a region is when talking climate, the regions are often divided east to west when thinking about climate. In the east along the Andes Mountains, you have what is called, well, the Andes region or zone. It's literally all along the Andes Mountains. Simple enough. This area is made up of sedimentary soil. While the Andes Mountains themselves will create a rain shadow effect when it comes to Argentina, the rain from that rain shadow has to end up somewhere and well, that's the actual mountains. So rain will fall mostly on the Chilean side. As far as the vineyards, the rain isn't as prominent, but what does happen is the rainwater moves down the mountain. The wines of Chile site describe this north to south band as an arid desert in the north and a lush desert in the south in Patagonia. For the record, Patagonia is a regional designation that covers the southern tip of South America. It's not Chile or Argentina exclusively. As far as I know, there's no legal boundary thing to it. Well, kind of, there are some legal boundaries things, but as far as the wine world, it's kind of murky. So how can you have a lush desert? Well, a desert by, is classified by the National Geographic as an area that gets less than 10 inches or 25 centimeters of annual precipitation a year, regardless of temperature. So as long as plants have access to water from rivers that form in the mountains, then you can have a lush desert, I guess. At least that's how I interpret it. Continuing, the mountains provide a cool breeze to regulate the temperature. This creates a slower maturation of vines in addition to a retention of acidity. In the west, we have the Costa region. As the name implies, it's all along the coast of the Pacific Ocean. Here we have a very similar climate. The Pacific provides a cool breeze thanks to the cold Humboldt current that travels from the Antarctic north along the coast of South America, starting around 45 degrees latitude where Chile is, up to Peru and then southern Ecuador. This heavily influences the climate here. The Humboldt current is the reason why it's so dry in the Atacama Desert in the northern part of Chile and the coastal regions of Peru and southern Ecuador. Essentially, it's too cold to generate precipitation. However, clouds and fog will happen. The soil is not sedimentary, but more sand and has a higher level of minerality. This combined with frequent morning fog also allows longer maturation with retention of acidity. So you effectively have the influence of a mountain range in a different way. At least that's how I interpreted this one also. Then we have the middle area known as Entre Cordilleras, or Between the Mountains. So while I mentioned that the Pacific Ocean and Humboldt Current act like a mountain range, there is an actual mountain range along the coast called, coincidentally enough, the Coastal Range or the Cordillera de la Costa in Spanish. It stretches from Moro de Arica in the northernmost part of Chile to the south at the Taitao Peninsula in the middle of Patagonia. That was a little bit of a mouthful for me. 
In this region, you have a Mediterranean climate, wet, mild winters, and warm to hot, dry summers. You have a combination of sedimentary soils and also cool nights. Essentially, due to the cooler nights, acidity will be retained in all three regions. Okay, so what about the two areas all the wines in this series come from? The Valle de Maipo Dio and the Valle de Colchagua Dio. Well, both are officially in the Valle Central Dio or the Central Valley. The Maipo Valley is in the northern part of the Central Valley. The Colchagua Valley is a sub-appellation of the Valle de Rappel Dio and is just south of the Maipo. The Valle de Cachapoal Dio and the Valle de Colchagua Dio make up the two sub-appellations of the Rappel Valley, with the Colchagua wrapping around the Cachapoal Valley to the south and the west. FYI, you may see maps that have the wines of Chile branding on it that show the Maipo Valley in the Akakangua region instead. Know that this is an error. Not sure if something changed in the past, but all the wines for these six episodes are officially in the Central Valley region. It also seems to me the Wines of Chile site isn't being updated and they have not been responsive to a couple of emails I sent. Okay, so the Maipo stretches from the Andes to the Pacific Ocean. So it has all three regions, Andes, Entre Corrieras, and the Costa. The Cochagua only encompasses the Andes and the Entre Corrieras regions. All the wines for this series will be Entre Corrieras wines. Strike that, reverse it. This has been challenging to present in Google Earth Pro as I don't know of any other country that has anything like this. However, since I've actually completed the maps after the script, I was able to kind of represent this by using the same color scheme the Wines of Chile maps use to show these climactic areas. Now that we've oriented ourselves with Chile, let's get familiar with today's wine. The rest of the series will be more normal and basically just focusing on each wine. Miguel Torres, of the group of wines I'll be doing, this is the winery I'm most familiar with by name. Los Vascos is also the other one I'm very familiar with. I'll be getting to that wine in a few episodes. Anyway, Miguel Torres is an iconic winery in Chile, but not just Chile. Their history goes back to Spain, as far back as 1559 when they were wine growers. In 1879, two brothers, Jaime and Miguel Torres Vendrell, founded their first winery in Catalonia, Spain. In 1979, Miguel Agustin Torres Rieta went to Chile and founded his eponymous winery in the town of Curico in the Mali Valley. They are committed to organic farming, innovation, and what is called fair trade. I'll just quote Wikipedia about fair trade here. Fair trade is an arrangement designed to help producers in growing countries achieve sustainable and equitable trade relationships. The fair trade movement combines the payment of higher prices to exporters with improved social and environmental standards. The movement focuses in particular on commodities or products that are typically exported by developing countries to developed countries, but is also used in domestic markets, for example, Brazil, the United Kingdom, and Bangladesh. Most notably for handcrafts, coffee, cocoa, wine, sugar, fruit, flowers, and gold. So I've heard of fair trade before, but I don't know if I've ever heard, I've ever had a fair trade wine before. I probably have. They were the first Chilean winery to export fair trade wines. Now this wine doesn't specifically have a fair trade logo, but they definitely have a line of fair trade wines. My guess is that they own the vineyard so there are no growers to work with. I'm not sure. Anyway, as you heard in the description, it's not commonly associated with wine. I've mostly heard it about uh, with coffee and chocolate though. They make several different lines of wines, nine from what I counted. This line currently has seven wines, each a different varietal and each comes from a different valley in Chile from the Entre Corrieras region in each of those valleys. Over the years, they expanded their vineyards and the line of wines they make. And these vineyards are spread out throughout much of Chile. All of their vineyards are 100% organic. Other wines are made from purchased fruit like this wine. For the Cordillera line of wines, they are looking for the finest expression of each variety in each valley. And this is coming from the Maipo Valley. 
as we look at the vineyard, let's talk about it. First of all, kudos to the winery for giving the exact coordinates in the text sheet for the 2018 vintage. So let's do the vineyard details real quick. It's the Vigna Colluvion. It's at 33 degrees, 42 minutes, 39 seconds south, and 70 degrees, 36 minutes, 23 seconds west. It's in the Perquet sector of Maipo Valley. The elevation is 780 meters, or about 2,559 feet. The distance to the Andes is zero kilometers. It's literally at the foot of the mountains. Its size is six hectares. The planting density is 3,950 vines per hectare. It uses a double cordon training system. Its orientation is north-south. That means how the vines run along the property. The soil is colluvial soils over clay loam alluvial soils. As the name implies, we are in the mountains, the foot of the Andes Mountains to be exact. While each of the six wines I'm reviewing during the session come from different, two different valleys, they are coming from the same climactic zone. My script said different. I don't know where I got that from. Anyway, also, colluvial soil is kind of a new one for me. I'm sure I've, been, I'm sure I've seen it before, but I'm seeing it frequently when talking about these wines. It's also known as colluvium. So what is it? Well, let's go back to Wikipedia. Colluvial soil is a general name for loose, unconsolidated sediments that have been deposited at the base of hill slopes by either rainwash, sheet wash, slow continuous downslope creep, or a variable combination of these processes. Colluvium is typically composed of a heterogeneous range of rock types and sediments ranging from silt to rock fragments of various sizes. This term is also used to spe specifically refer to sediment deposited at the base of a hill slope by unconcentrated surface runoff or sheet erosion. Okay, so what about alluvial? Well, let's also go to Wikipedia. The definitions of colluvium and alluvium are interdependent and reliant on one another. Distinctions between the two are important in order to properly define the geomorphic processes that have occurred in a specific geological setting. Alluvium is sand, clay, and other similar det detrital material deposited by running water. The distinction between colluvium and alluvium relates to the involvement of running water. Alluvium specifically refers to the geomorphic processes involved with flowing water. And so alluvium is generally fine-grained clay and silt material that has the capacity to be entrained in water currents and eventually deposited. For these same reasons, alluvium is also generally well-sorted material while colluvium is not. All right, so if I read all this correctly, Colluvial has bigger bits than alluvial. All right. Before I get into the wine, I also want to mention that they are also part of a group of 12 family-owned wineries called Primum Familiae Vini, or the first family of wines. I may have mentioned this in an older episode reviewing a wine from a different winery. The link for them is in the description. Here are the details about this wine. They give a lot of stats, so this may take two panels. The 2018 Miguel Torres Cordillera de los Andes Cabernet Sauvignon Reserva Especial. Suggested retail price, about 20 bucks. It's 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. It's from the Valle de Maipo Dio. Harvest dates were from March 12th through the 27th. Maceration was 14 days. Fermented in stainless steel tanks for five days. Fermentation temperature was 24 degrees Celsius or 75 degrees Fahrenheit. It was aged for 12 months in French oak, 20% was new, 80% second use. The ABV is 14%, the pH is 3.6, the total acidity is 5.4 grams per liter, and the residual sugar is 2.1 grams per liter. It was bottled in November 2019, and they produced 27,000 bottles. All right, let's get into the wine. All righty. So... Hopefully, so this is the second set of reviews I recorded, and I'm actually recording during the day, believe it or not. It is, I don't know, it's 1537 in the daytime. I hope so, because it'd be kind of hard to be 1537 at night. Anyway, um, yes, I use, in general, I use 24-hour clocks. Um, I just like them for some reason. I was not in the military or anything like that. But I also noticed that Europeans tend to use the 24-hour clock rather than the 12-hour clock like we do. All right, so um, I'm going to see if this works now. So when I tried to do the white wines, 
I, I, I don't, you may have mentioned, heard me mention white wines and doing top down looks. So my phone was in a battery case. So I have, I have my iPhone 10 up like literally right there and it's hanging from this chandelier type thing. <laughs> so it's pointing down and it's got a weird angle, but I had it in a battery case. So I always had power. So it would not turn off because I knew the session would be about two or three hours because like this camera, the iPhone 11 is plugged into power. So it'll, I don't have to worry about it. So as I was doing my color thing, um, at some point the connection to the iPhone. So I, you know, this is my iPad and I use the control everything. Um, the iPhone kept turning off the iPhone 10. I was like, what's going on? It overheated because the case is a battery case and yeah, it, yeah, it didn't work anyway. So long story short er is we're going to attempt to do some color stuff and hopefully the phone doesn't crap out on me oh, for these next however many wines. So, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a little hazy on the color. Uh, they didn't mention anything about finding and filtering. But I'm sure it's filtered at some point, but it's it's like a kind of a duller color, kind of a deeper red. There does seem to be a little bit of browning. So, I mean, it is an 18. We're talking actually truly four years now um, since this is July that I'm re reviewing the wine. Um, so there might be a touch of browning too. There's a little bit light staining, I'll call it medium minus staining. Tearing. Uh, medium plus that matches the 14 percent okay let's check it out it's kind of modern intensity it's it's youthful ish it's not like super youthful but it's not like i wouldn't call it, put it to the developing side of things i mean i also also was four years old so i'm looking for certain things to kind of confirmation bias um you know be like oh yes it's there because i know it's supposed to be there right that's always the risk when you're reviewing wines that you know what they are Versus when you're doing blind tasting, you have no idea, and then you get yourself painted in a corner sometimes. Not that it's ever happened to me. But anyway, so um, the fruit comes across as a little bit drier. Um, it's more red fruit and black fruit, which it should be. Um, I mean, it's red, black, and blue, basically. But red and black fruit, not really any blue fruit. I get a bit of uh, tobacco on the nose. You get a bit of green. It's more of like a not, a, not necessarily a bell pepper thing, because I'm totally expecting to get pyrazine on every single one of these wines. But it may be different levels of pyrazine. That's what gives you the, the bell pepper jalapeno type of thing, but also can give you herbaceousness. Um, so it, it, it gives you a green characteristic to a wine. But it's kind of there. It's, it's uh, I get a little bit of like kind of woodsiness. I, I, I've been using the word, I use the word bramble a whole lot during certain reviews, but it's like you just kind of walk out into like a, a wooded area or an area with a lot of brush and you smell kind of dirt. There's a little bit of dirt in this, kind of like you're walking down a dirt path and you've got like the kind of the grasses around you, that type of thing. And, you know, it's like 110 degrees out and like the grass is like yellow because it's so freaking hot and dried out. That's what this smells like. Not quite. I was going to a little leather. A little bit of a little bit of dust. I mean, as far as the wood, um, you know, there's there was a little bit of new wood in there. I don't really get the new wood. I mean, it's 80 percent, if I remember correctly, of second use. So it's still going to have some influence, but not a lot. So I don't really get off the top that that new oak, vanilla, clove, cinnamon, especially for French oak. I don't really get that in there. Baking spices. Um, I did get a little bit of meatiness out of it. So let's go and taste the wine. There's this kind of bitter dried fruit thing going on here. Like in a blind, I would be kind of debating whether this was old world or new world. The alcohol's coming through. I can taste, I can feel that the 14% is coming through. So that would lead me to believe new world in an old world style or a cooler climate or a cooler vintage type of thing. Um, I really like this wine. Just just to put that out right now. Um, it kind of checks a lot of boxes for me. Um, the alcohol feels a little bit more present than I would like at 14%, but um, it's still a very delicious wine and totally with food. I mean, come on. But so I'm getting those those dried red fruits. I get a little cranberry on that, um, but I get the raspberry and a blackberry. Um, that's about the main stuff. I still get that fern or kind of herbaceous green type of thing. Not not really any bell pepper or or jalapeno pepper or that type of pyrazinic thing, which is totally fine. 
Ooh, I did just get a whiff of bell pepper. So it may just take some time to, to come through. Mm -hmm. It's there. I think in a blind, I'd be like, going, okay, I get the pyrazines. I'm, I'm thinking cooler climate or an area that's known for pyrazinic uh, wine. So my mind will, would already start be going, this is potentially Bordeaux, or I might be thinking Cabernet Franc from Loire, from Chinon or Bourguil, um, a cool climate Napa or Chile. And probably because the alcohol, so it wouldn't be Chinon, probably not Bordeaux if, if we're talking that alcohol, um, but I'd probably be centering on Chile. Hopefully I would, but I think this wine is really delicious. The, again, the oak aging, it's, it's there in the sense you have a smoothness, a roundness to it. Uh, the tannin is very well integrated. It is not like super hitting, hitting my mouth. I mean, it's really, I would say, elegant and silky. There is a bit of roasted coffee to this. Um, that leather is there, that dirt is there. Um, dried flowers. So a lot of my descriptors would lead you to believe old world. Um, but the fruit, even though I keep talking about it's dry, um, there is a ripeness to the fruit, like there's a juiciness to the fruit, and that would hopefully take me back to New World. I think it's a wonderfully made wine, and it's 20 bucks. Like, heck yeah. I think I think this wine is super delicious, and if you can find this, um, I think this is one of those ones that, that, are, that are widely available. If I remember correctly, note to self, um, put down the availability somewhere in a lower third or something for each of the wines. Mm. I mean, this, 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 this wine craves steak, any type of like roasted meat, like barbecue, um, that type of stuff. This would be great with that stews, you know, your, your usual, like really, uh, full bodied, uh, not super bold. It's actually kind of medium in a lot of things, but it's super delicious. And I think, uh, with some type of meat type of beef type of, um, food going on is to be perfect for that. All right. So that's just going to do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and then tell all your friends and we'll see you next time.